Hello, everybody. Hello from UMass Lowell. Very nice to see you here today. Again, welcome to the 24th Annual International Business Ethics Case Competition. We are the premier business ethics case competition in the world. We have had a number of people from many different countries uh, competing and participating. My name is Jim Arnold, and I am your Uber judge for today, also known as a, a senior judge. There are seven of us senior judges. We have been around for many, many years with IBEC, which is just a very nice way of saying we're very old. And I've been uh, with IBEC for since 2006, and so that puts me at 15 years. We're all here because we love IBEC. We love all of the students and we just love everything that, 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 that the organization stands for and especially what you all bring to the table in business ethics. I feel like you are our harbinger for the future. You, you teach us many things that are, that are going on as well. So we're just so glad that you uh, made it. Let's just start by introducing our judges to you. And, and then we'll have the team, uh, we'll have the individuals in the team introduce uh, themselves as well. So Shabani, would you start us out? Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Shabani Nag and I'm speaking to you from Sacramento, California. So uh, this time zone over here, great to meet you virtually. And, and thank you for your participation and for your interest in business ethics. I have to say that during these times in COVID, um, things are getting a little crazy with Zoom and Teams and all these various ways of communicating. And so I just really uh, commend you for, for finding a way to still stay connected to us. Um, a little bit about my background. I have a background in organizational change management. And so I talk in my day to day, I talk a lot about culture and ethics and, and those types of things. And so I very much enjoy participating in these conversations with you. And um, let's see, as Tom had mentioned, I was a participant uh, with the grad school team back in 2006. And since then have stayed connected through alumni and otherwise and have been judging since then. And it's been a tremendous experience. And so I welcome you all to, to the IBEC family. Hopefully you stay in touch uh, through LinkedIn and beyond. And we look forward to your presentation and good luck. Thanks, Shabani. Allison, would you introduce yourself? I'm Allison Taunton Rigby. And um, my, uh, and by the way, this is my first year doing this. So I'm the newbie welcome. on the team, but um, my background, I'm a scientist. I've worked in healthcare all my life. I worked in the biotech industry. I'm Boston based. Um, I actually have worked to, in companies that develop vaccines. Um, so it's a field I'm very fairly familiar with. Um, I was CEO of several public biotech companies. Today, I sit on a number of boards of directors, um, some healthcare companies, biotech companies, and Boston Children's Hospital. And I'm looking forward to your presentation. It's a very interesting topic. No, definitely. Thank you much. Irina? Hi, hi everyone. Uh, so uh, my name is Irina Demianova. Uh, as I mentioned already, I'm joining you today from Dubai, but uh, normally I'm based in uh, Warsaw in Poland. Uh, whilst actually I'm coming from Ukraine. I'm uh, originally from Kiev and I moved uh, because of work a couple of years ago to Poland. Uh, so I work for GlaxoSmithKline Consumer Healthcare uh, and actually uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working for Consumer Healthcare Division, but obviously we have a single um, uh, general manager, Emma Walmsley, who is responsible for pharma division as well and obviously the topic of vaccines is quite uh, quite familiar to to me and very interesting um i'm great uh, I'm, I'm so grateful to be here you know the opportunity is is, is so exciting um since last year i was hoping uh, that this year the competition will again go uh via uh, you know zoom or or any other technical <laughs> solutions because that's the only way how i could join uh this one and i really i'm really so ha so happy to be here uh, so guys very excited to meet you all and just to share my background quickly. Um, so as I mentioned, I work in the consumer healthcare uh, GlaxoSmithKline company as ethics and compliance director for Central and Eastern Europe, which is uh, 33 countries uh, I'm responsible for. Uh, I'm here for six years now. And before then uh, I had been uh, as uh, working as legal and as a compliance in different companies in food and beverages and in cosmetics. Um, and um, uh, I am actually having a degree in law. Uh, so uh, very happy to be here and uh, uh, very much hoping uh, for, for a great presentation today. Wish you all the best luck and uh, looking forward to hear from you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank, thanks very much. 
And we also have a very important person who's in the room who also has been with IBEC for a very long time, especially important with where we are right now with Zoom, et cetera, and that's Ravi, our technical expert. Ravi, would you say hello? Hi, everybody. Uh, Ravi Rajan here. Yeah, I've been with uh, IBEC since 96 when it first started. Um, I Just a couple things. I uh, have dropped my number in the chat window. So you may want to jot it down. If you drop off or anything, you could just call or text me directly and I'll help you out. Um, just make sure when you're not talking to mute your mic and um, uh, good luck to everybody. Thanks. And also Robbie will be spotlighting you when you are speaking, you will be spotlighted. So you will be the only person that's actually on the screen and the rest of us will, we will just be plain all blacked out. So. You'll be, you'll be the star of your show when you are speaking. Excellent. Now, we've read your executive summaries and we see that our role is as the Pfizer's board of directors. Is that, is that still true? Excellent. And your, your role is as Pfizer's internal ethics advisory council. Excellent. That's great. Now, I'm going to read you a paragraph that you've undoubtedly seen before. And if you haven't seen it, you know everything that's in it. We do this from an ethical standpoint so that every team hears the exact same thing before they start, even though it is a bit redundant. Full presentation. In this part of the presentation in the competition, you are taking on a fictional business identity and assigning a fictional business identity to the judges. Please make sure everyone knows who you are and who they are before you begin. We've just done that. You will have 25 minutes with a five minute cushion, so basically 30 minutes, to describe the legal, financial, and ethical dimensions of the problem and to recommend a solution that passes muster on all three of those counts. During this time, we, you will not be interrupted. The judges will not interrupt you while you are speaking. Now, at the end of uh, your presentation, then the judges will start asking you questions. We will stay in our role as the board of directors. You will stay in your role as the uh, ethics committee. And we'll have about 20 minutes of Q&A. Each of the judges will have something to, uh, some things to ask. And after the Q&A, we will take off those hats. We will become ourselves again. And we'll just give you some feedback on your, on your presentation overall. The ethical uh, aspects of your analysis are the most important. However, these should be described in a simple, practical, common sense fashion. Using technical, philosophical terminology or basing your argument on religious or theological grounds will be considered a serious weakness. During this presentation, every member of the team must have a speaking role. And during Q&A, we do ask that each of you jumps in and answers uh, at least one question. Just one, one final thing. If we were live in, in, in Boston, you would be looking at us judges and you would be giving us your eye contact. We'd like you to still do that today by looking into the camera when you speak to us. I know you've been in plenty of, of, of Zoom situations where people are looking down at their screen, thinking they're actually looking at people, but they're not. And so you rarely see people making good eye contact through their camera. So we're gonna get, get started with a good habit there and have you always looking in your camera when you are speaking. Any questions from anybody before we get going? Robbie, are you, uh, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, I will, uh, I will mute myself and the rest of us will mute as well. And Robbie, we'll get, you, uh, we'll get you started whenever you're ready. Again, welcome to IBEC and good luck. Thank you. I'm just going to begin by sharing my screen and then we'll start in. You should be able to see my the, our presentation right now. Are you all able to see it? Yep. Yep. As soon as Rob, and Robbie will spotlight you and we'll get started. Um. I apologize, but I'm actually speaking first, uh, so I would be spotlighted first. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. Just give me a second here. No problem. It just went into full screen on me, and then uh, there we go. 
Thank you. Should be good now. Good afternoon. We're the Internal Ethical Advisory Council for Pfizer. And today we'll be discussing, uh, we'll be addressing inequitable distribution of COVID-19 vaccine. I'm Roger Wara, and I'm joined by my associates, Thomas Strandberg and Prabhakar Adithya. We would like to start by highlighting a story that we believe encapsulates the inequitable distribution of this vaccine very well. Now, as we know, the COVID-19 vaccine has different eligibilities. We know there exists different elig eligibilities for people of higher risk or people of older ages. And this is so, this is, the vaccine is distributed in an equitable manner. Often, this is not accepted by everybody. As such, two women were simply incapable to accept this and wait their turn. And they discovered a distribution center in Las Vegas where identification was very weak. They drove over to this uh, center and they were able to get their first dose. Even so, they went in to get their second dose when they were finally caught. This story not only highlights the inequity that exists between the privileged and the unprivileged, but it also shows a severe flaw in the entire system with, the, with respect to distribution. And this is what we will strive to address today in our presentation. Now, I would like to hand it over to my associate, Tom, who will discuss our specific role at Pfizer and also the business perspective. Thank you, Raj. I'll be going over who we are and what we stand for, the current state of the pandemic, the business, ethical, and legal issues, our recommended solution, and then we'll be ending with our conclusion. Now, we are, or our business identity, is an internal advisory council that makes sure Pfizer's actions and organization live up to the obligation and expectations our stakeholders have of us. We always want to respect the business, ethical, and legal factors of Pfizer's culture and make sure that we tailor our vaccine rollout to align in real time with the pandemic's needs. We need to begin by understanding Pfizer's mission, culture, and core values, which we're keeping in mind when we're suggesting developments in a corporate environment. Now, Pfizer began with the simple purpose of working towards the public's benefit. It advances medical care and improves patients' outcomes. We believe all people deserve to live healthy lives, and this goal drives us to deliver safe, effective, and affordable medicine. Here at Pfizer, we created the first COVID-19 vaccine and have already administered the most doses globally in what we recognize as creating breakthroughs that change our patients' lives. We are a leader in the pharmaceutical industry and always strive to set the highest standards for quality, safety, and value when developing new innovations. We're constantly working to conduct ourselves ethically and ensure our products and processes are always of the highest quality. Currently, the US has partially vaccinated 27% of the population, but only 14.7% is fully vaccinated. According to the CDC, to effectively combat the coronavirus pandemic, we need to fully vaccinate 80% of the population. Now, Massachusetts is ranked seventh in the country by doses distributed and administered as a percentage of the population, meaning we're actually ahead of the curve in this state, but a lot of improvements could still be made. While we've been ramping up our supply of the vaccine to meet demand, in the following slides, we'll show you how the current distribution model is failing to effectively deliver on our goal to vaccinate a majority of the population while wasting the vaccine doses and creating compounding equity problems within our society. Now, what you see here is the current distribution model for a state like Massachusetts, as an example, where the federal government issues us orders to produce a certain quantity of the vaccine, which we deliver using just-in-time production methods to the states who assign quantities to local public groups in Massachusetts like FEMA, who operates out of Gillette Stadium, or private groups who would operate out of the Natick Mall in a vaccination site. The issue with this model is that the information only flows down the distribution models as they receive the shipments of vaccines which prevents them from anticipating how many doses they will receive or providing feedback about the demand and their ability to administer the vaccine. If Pfizer is producing enough vaccines to inoculate the entire US population, but the vaccination centers are unable to administer all the doses they receive and are wasting large amounts of our supplies, it's undermining our ability to effectively combat the pandemic and prevent further deaths within communities. These vaccines are extremely time sensitive. So rural areas that unexpectedly receive massive shipments of doses after not receiving any for quite some time causes a massive stress in the system. 
they're unable to reach out to enough patients before doses go bad. And you can really see how inefficient the system is in states like Alabama, Wisconsin, or Kansas, who are only able to have used 40% of their available doses. We've met with doctors on the front lines who explain that people are booking multiple appointments and not showing up to their registered times, which causes these vaccination centers to scramble to fill appointments as they near the end of the day and entire bottles are thrown out, only partially used. This can cause centers to throw out as many as 1,800 COVID shots in a single day. And it is inexcusable to waste so many when each dose is a potential life saved. This is an easily resolvable issue using feedback from vaccine distribution centers about how many doses they've wasted so we can ensure a certain percentage of our vaccine shipments to them come in smaller micro dose bottles, which as the day winds down, the doctor could begin transitioning to using and effectively reduce the leftover waste caused by patients not showing up for appointments. Otherwise, we're placing doctors in a difficult position where they wanna vaccinate as many people as possible and avoid wasting this life-saving medicine, but they could be fired for administering it to patients who are not signed up. Now, this is a great slide summarizing how we at Pfizer are effectively supplying the vaccine, but there's still a massive disparity in the amount administered in the state of Massachusetts alone. And we need to communicate more effectively with distribution sites, how many doses they can expect to receive so they can warn more patients ahead of time that they may be called in earlier to receive a dose when other patients do not show up for their appointments. Our distribution approach ships directly from our manufacturing facility in Kalamazoo, Michigan to the point of use sites. And we already have control towers in place that track the location and temperature of each vaccine, vaccination shipment across their preset routes. We're operating these 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and these GPS enabled devices allow us to proactively prevent unwanted deviations and act before they happen. And it really wouldn't be that difficult for us to provide health centers with advanced warning how many doses they can expect to receive and when. This is an affordable solution to the problem where we are leveraging our predictive models to address the business factors contributing to the pandemic. Now, improving the distribution channel is a major issue Pfizer can and will need to address as we take a leadership presence in the global market for vaccines. It is estimated that the global market for COVID-19 vaccine shots alone will be worth more than $15 billion as of 2023. And we are still only in the introduction stages of our product's life cycle, which means we have massive improvements to make in our production and distribution models if we hope to capture this demand. Now, vaccines have much lower margins, so our ROI and future profitability hinges entirely on our ability to optimize our role and invest intelligently to produce the most efficient outcomes. We feel confident that we are up to the challenge of scaling, manufacturing, and distributing the COVID-19 vaccine efficiently, as we have an extensive past working with the US government during the Civil War, supplying more painkillers and any septics than any other firm, or during World War II, how we at Pfizer became the world leader of the miracle drug penicillin, which helped us recognize and address issues early on to better meet our stakeholders' expectations. Now, my associate Raj will be examining the equity ramifications for us at Pfizer surrounding the current distribution system. Thank you, Tom. From an ethical perspective, Pfizer focuses on, evidently focuses during the pandemic to achieve the greatest good for the most amount of people. We want to deliver the vaccine in an efficient manner and deliver it to as many people as possible in an appropriate amount of time. But this is just a benchmark for our industry. We at Pfizer have always strived to be at a higher standard. As such, our ethical values reflect this. We, our core values of equity and community attest that we hear everybody, regardless of the color of their skin or their income or who they're connected with. Everybody deserves the same health care. And we have a duty and it's imperative that we value what we actually say. But we don't just say this without actually reflecting this within our actions at Pfizer. We make our employees wait for the vaccine until they're eligible for it. They can't just get the vaccine early just because they work for Pfizer. They have to wait for the proper fates. Ethics are super important to, for us here at Pfizer. And if we re reflect our ethics to the best of our ability, we can become a industry leader, ethically speaking. 
However, there are tangible, there's tangible harm today with respect to our ethical values. One example of this is line skipping. Now, if we look at distribution centers such as Roxbury, Massachusetts, these distribution centers are established in minority communities to help the inequity that exists. However, this is not the case. One worker at, at the distribution center located in Roxbury, Massachusetts stated that out of the 40 people there, only about five were from minority communities. And the other 35 were from other towns or cities that simply booked appointments in multiple different places and got their number in Roxbury. This is horrendous. This distribution center was established for minority communities to equitably serve them the vaccine. And if it can't accomplish this, it's just another problem in the inequitable distribution of the vaccine. And this continues on to the nepotism. As I mentioned earlier, we at Pfizer believe in, in our duty to serve everyone equitably and our employees don't have an advantage. This is not true in, other medical, in, the, in the medical industry and other hospitals, however, especially in Culver City Hospital in California. Now, for a minute, imagine you've been waiting for your vaccine for months and finally arrive in the hospital only to be surpassed by someone who knows upper management or is related to upper management. This is not ethically defensible and this poses tangible harm with respect to our core ethical values at Pfizer to treat everyone with equity. Not to mention the harm the delay in receiving the vaccine can have on someone who's vulnerable to the disease. These problems effectively create three major distinctions in the inequitable distribution of this vaccine with respect to race, income, and connections. Now, breaking down the racial inequity within this country, you can clearly see there is a disparity between white populations and minority populations. White populations are predominantly far more likely to be vaccinated than minority populations. Historically speaking, this has been a trend. Minorities have been at a disadvantage with respect to the healthcare industry for years in this country. And even more so, they're far more likely to be vulnerable to diseases. Now, just think about that for a second. The people who are at a higher need for this vaccine because they're more vulnerable to the disease are the ones who have the lowest numbers. That's absurd. And there's a lot of reasons why this exists, but most importantly, we've identified this is because of misinformation and the general distrust that exists with the minority communities and also the healthcare industry. This poses tangible harm because people of minority communities generally resist the vaccine which causes even further disparity between people who received it and people who haven't received it. Now, the ethical impact. With respect to our ethical values, in the short term, we have to address misinformation and educate those who are resistant to the vaccine. This means establishing a trusted relationship in the long term with minority communities and ensuring them that we're here to help them and not to harm them establishing distribution centers where they can come to us if they have a problem and they can address it with us and establishing a trusted relationship so they have something to believe in and so we can lower the inequity that, that exists within the distribution of this vaccine. This solution is the only ethically acceptable one. Now I would like to hand it over to my associate Adithya who will discuss the legal implications. Thank you so much, Raj. Under our current legal situation, under the emergency use authorization by the FDA, Pfizer is obligated to supply the U.S. government with 100 million doses, and the U.S. can acquire an additional 500 million doses if needed. Pfizer has met these obligations and continues to meet these obligations, but we have to ask this question. Is Pfizer meeting the obligations and expectations of our shareholders and consumers that use our product? I wanna talk about the PREP Act or Public Readiness Emergency Preparedness Act. So under the PREP Act, it states that a covered person shall be immune from suit and liability under federal and state law with respect to all claims for loss caused by, arising out of, result, relating to, or resulting from the administration or use by an individual of a covered countermeasure. The PREP Act goes on to state that a covered person is defined as one that manufactures, distributes, administers, prescribes, or uses a covered countermeasure. Under the PREP Act, Pfizer has qualified as a covered person, and the drug or device that we're using, the vaccine, qualifies as a covered countermeasure, which protects us from 
side effects that any consumers might have. I want to talk about the miscommunication issue. Vaccine uh, sites are everywhere in America, but there is a massive issue with top-down communication. And while it's not our legal obligation, we still have a responsibility to resolve this issue to our shareholders, stakeholders, and consumers. You must have seen it all over the news. And as someone who is in a big company, we don't tend to see this at a smaller scale. But for me, I can attest to the fact that there is a miscommunication issue. My father, who I was eligible for the vaccine and why I had to help pre-register was getting lost in signing up for different websites. And even when we called the hotline, the 211 hotline to try and sign up, we were redirected to multiple different call hosts and we were getting confused and lost. And we had to wait a few hours until we could finally have someone help us to pre-register for, for the vaccine. There's a huge, huge misinformation problem regarding vaccines today. You can see that UNICEF is fighting so hard as it's such a trusted source and they're fighting so hard to uh, remove the distrust that there is regarding the vaccine. Over, over time, people have uh, managed to be averse to vaccina vaccinations. And the fact that we only took eight months to produce the vaccine and distribute it isn't really helping anybody's case. You can see that TikTok, a uh, social media post for young adults, more specifically Gen Z and millennials, uh, is a prime place for misinformation and uh, adversity to the vaccine to spread. Now, as a result of miscommunication and misinformation, there's a huge issue with illicit behavior that is spurred as a result of those. Underground black markets with illegal vaccination cards and illegal COVID-19 tests have been more popular than ever now. And young adults who feel like they're invincible to COVID, uh, but still wanna go and party, still wanna go to public places, but don't wanna wait for the vaccines, will turn to these black markets and go and try and party in public places just because they don't wanna wait their turn. Also, a result of misinformation is bogus vaccines. Those who are of the elder generation may get confused by some of the information that's flying around everywhere, lost in a almost vac vaccine vacuum of information. And they could fall pr uh, privy to bogus vaccines, which could cause fatal, fatal side effects. Our legal impact for Pfizer is what I'm gonna talk about right now. So under our current situation, we are covered by the PREP Act, the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act. Going forward in the short term, we wanna place a standard for ethical vaccine distribution going forward. As an industry leader, we have to hold ourselves accountable to a higher standard and benchmark for the rest of the industry. We believe in transparency and following government regulations. For the long term, we wanna make sure that we get ahead of lawsuits. While we don't foresee any lawsuit at this time, we live in an extremely litigious society. And so we could be sued at any time. As a result, in that case, if there is some other unexpected legal trouble, we want to be sure that we have a reserve set aside to use for that time. This is our solution. For the short term, we wanna produce micro doses, micro doses so that we can eliminate the uh, waste of vaccines. We wanna make sure that the smaller doses that we have are used going towards PCP and smaller clinics and are not uh, tossed aside because having people who, uh, who don't show up, who sign up but don't attend the vaccination sites increases a waste in vaccines as these vaccines are extremely time sensitive. And we want to establish a trust and a relationship with minority communities that, so that they know who we are as people. Historically, minority communities have been prejudiced against and have had bad experiences with big pharmaceutical companies. We want to eliminate that. And we need to create a strong social media team. We need to establish a strong social media presence and we need to create TV advertisements to reach an elder generation. In the long term, we want to make sure that we invest funds in cross-sector collaboration. We want to work with trusted sources such as the World Health Organization and the United Nations, as well as trusted distribution services such as UPS and FedEx 
to really re reach our goal and mission statement of equitable healthcare globally. And we also want to address distribution change issues, which can occur everywhere. We want to have research that tackles where things were going wrong and how we can combat that going forward. Now, I'm going to pass it on over to my colleague, Raj, who will conclude our presentation. Thank you, Aditya. From everything we've discussed today, the bottom line is addressing this inequity. Not only are the solutions we presented ethically acceptable, they're also legally viable and incredibly affordable. We can see Pfizer becoming a global leader in ethics and business through this practice and also establishing the cross-sector partnerships as my colleague Aditya mentioned. With respect to the story I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the two women dressed as older women to get the vaccine early. We at Pfizer have the duty to serve everyone regardless of their beliefs and situation. And we simply cannot enable a system where some people can skip over a vulnerable individual by putting on a costume. Thank you so much for listening to our presentation. If you have any questions, we'll take it now. Okay, thank you team. We'll give Ravi a second here to take us off of spotlight. And can you please close your uh, PowerPoints if you would? Okay, and uh, let me go to gallery view. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Now your, your board of directors has some, some uh, business and ethical and, and legal questions to ask of you. And we of course are going to, are your board members. We have nothing to do with judging at this point. I will, uh, I'll just ask the first question and then we'll just open it up to all the judges, all the board members, excuse me. My question for you is, how are we gonna get all this done when our time frame is so short? We don't, we, uh, you know, the, maybe we're not doing things as fast as we could right now, but it's not like we're gonna have a whole lot of time before we get the, the, the COVID thing behind us. It, unless you don't agree with that statement, how are we gonna get all this done in such a short time frame? So I could ha help answer the statement. So that's why we are addressing in a short-term and long-term approach, because in the short term, we understand that there's many learning outcomes that we need to take away from this. This is a distribution as never seen before, but in the long term, we understand that there's going to be annual shots for COVID that are needed. That's why the market is so huge. And of course, Pfizer will lead our way into this. And so we want to make sure that we're taking our approach that makes sense on a global level. We're always looking ahead and making sure it makes sense in the long term without missing the short term. To also add to what Tom spoke um, of, um, again, the short term and the long term is to address the issue of the time sensitivity. And um, that's why we have solutions such as producing microdoses for the short term, because we know that can be done in a quick manner and it's only in control of Pfizer. As opposed to the larger issues at hand, the long term with distribution, we know that will take cross-sector collaboration and also a lot of work. And we also know pandemics and COVID shots are a, maybe a, re, a repeating thing. So we want to make sure we're ready for that in the future uh, with respect to the long-term solution. Okay, thank you. That was the easy question. And now we will go on to, uh, to the other board members. Allison, looks like you wanna start. Yes, um, I want to say thank you for your presentation. It's really good. You've uh, done a lot of work and uh, I really appreciate the input that you're, you're giving us, but I, 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 you know, as a member of the board of directors, I'm not sure how we actually manage to address these issues. I mean, we signed, it came before the board um, last summer, we signed up, we, we approved a very large agreement with the federal government that we would supply the government with um, vaccine. And, um, you know, we ship it from Kalamazoo, but it just goes to a federal center. And we have title is passed at that point in time to the federal government. We have no, I don't see how we have any ability to control how the federal government distributes this product. So can you help me understand this and how we might deal with a challenge like this? Yeah, I can uh, hop on that. That's a really good question. I think that's a very valid question, right? When we as Pfizer, our private company, when we pass over to a distribution services, it's not so much so that we don't have anything to do with it as much as that we have to hold ourselves as an industry leader, that we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. And our solutions don't exactly tackle the distribution services itself so much so as they tackle 
uh, what's going on around it. So when we mentioned that we want to partner with the World Health Organization, the United Nations in the long term, that's something that we as a private company are doing. When we mentioned that we want to establish a social media team and create a strong positive report with minority uh, communities, that's something that we're doing to ensure that misinformation and miscommunication are kind of dissipating. We're not really tackling the solution at source as so much as we're tackling the issues surrounding that. Just to add on to that, in terms of our actual distribution, we are shipping from our Kalamazoo factory directly to the point of use centers. And so we're acting as this bridge between communication where there's sort of this federal and state divide on who is accountable. And we wanna make sure that our doses aren't being wasted. This is why we wanna make sure that we're using our control towers that we already built. Pfizer at the beginning of the pandemic took the initiative. They said, hey, these vaccination centers aren't gonna be able to store these doses for long enough to get them in people's arms, get them in the people that need them. So Pfizer, we developed these shippers, these containers that are allow us to keep them cold, keep them frozen and make sure that they arrive in the destinations all right to use. That's why when we look at these control towers, there's such a leveraging force for us really that we can make sure that the centers know how much they're receiving. So can you explain to me what's the role of the federal government vis-a-vis -vis the states? Because I thought as a board member of Pfizer that um, the, the government tells ships the, 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 the vaccine to the different states. They decide what how much goes to each state based on population. Isn't that how that happens? Yes, that is the process. The federal, Reserve, uh, the federal government informs us how many doses to produce. And then the state tells us how many that they are getting and the state attributes them to each group. So there's public and private groups and we send that amount to the public or private groups at these centers. And just to add to that, the federal government and uh, we as Pfizer advising the federal government and consulting them with the distribution process, they set up the guides, uh, the guidelines and the regulations for the states, but it's up to the states to inter uh, interpret these guidelines and see how they would distribute it in the future. This does create a conflict of rights. However, it, all we can really do at Pfizer is be a higher standard and also do our best to inform the federal government on how to do this. In the end, it is in their hands, but we can do, uh, we can do more than we are currently by consulting them and advising them on how to do uh, distribute it better. Thank you. So I think my question is quite connected to the one which Alison uh, asked you. So uh, the question is uh, again about this uh, circle of influence, let's say. Uh, so from one side, uh, you are recommending to create the micro doses, which makes perfect sense and it's under our control. The, financial implications are still to be you know defined but uh, with regards to the um, building relationship with the community and trust yeah so my question relates to uh, to this point um, so from one side we are as a uh, organization which is actually commercial organization and from the other side the government there are also our competitors who are producing vaccines and maybe even more companies will come on the stage uh, so how do you see this, um, um, maybe some more thoughts uh, you have offered to establish the info center where we would uh, explain to the community a bit more about uh, the vaccination, building this trust, um, running this uh, communication campaigns. So what is the um, role which you see uh, companies like ours uh, have uh, versus government and wouldn't it be seen in such a um, stressful time let's say and so much of anxiety amongst people uh, the campaigns run by the commercial organization wouldn't it be seen as uh, promoting uh, or encouraging use of uh, our specific vaccines when actually the society's interest is to just get vaccinated whether with our ours vaccine or with any others just to fight the pandemic so what are your thoughts with this regards so to address that um, that is something we have considered for a very long time as an ethical board and what we have basically concluded is that again this goes back to we at Pfizer being an industry leader and also holding ourselves to a higher standard and instead of just um, kind of ensuring the public and addressing this misinformation that exists around this vaccine and we know there's tons of that 
we want to ensure trust around the COVID-19 vaccine, not the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. And we will do this for our industry, not just Pfizer, but for all the other um, uh, industry leaders are, there are for the COVID-19 vaccine. And we know this is not may not be the best interest for our private company interests. However, this is in our best interest at, uh, with respect to ethics. This will set us apart as an ethical industry leader. And part of this is that when we're looking on a long-term scale, we're actually thinking about this in a global manner. And so you look at some foreign bodies or actors like the GRU by Russia that are trying to discredit Western vaccines in general. And this hurts us regardless of which vaccine it is. And so we want to learn from these types of mistakes and address this information. We're bridging these communities. Our role is we at Pfizer are someone you can trust. We want people to see, hey, that person is administering the vaccine in my language. They look like the people in my community. I feel comfortable going and getting this vaccine. So when we take it on a global stage, we feel ready to address everything. We're everywhere in terms of the world already. We have an entire army of supply staff that are ready to distribute it. It's about taking the right approach and using this early lessons to move on. And to add to my colleague Raj's point, when we consider United States, and when you mentioned that as a private company, versus for the general good, we are focused on the general good. And so going forward, we know that return on investment is a huge point for a private company. But if we state ourselves now as a company that sets itself for everybody, not just for ourselves, that provides a greater return on investment going forward and stands up against companies that mostly focus on themselves. Thank you. This answers my question. And indeed, uh, I think engaging the healthcare professionals, but uh, really transparently stating that it's uh, Pfizer, uh, engaging them to explain the um, the need yeah, and the, the effects, the positive effects, it, it makes sense. And I think that what you have uh, pointed out is that as an industry leader who has as part of their values, equity and community, which uh, you cannot uh, afford to, uh, to to see being, uh, uh, you know, uh, under uh, undervalued yeah, by, by, by the, the, what, what's currently ongoing, it makes perfect sense to me. Thank you very much. It's clear. Bonnie, did you have questions? I do. Um, I have one clarifying question. And then one supply chain question, if that works. And so a uh, clarifying point, I was thinking about the different um, problems, I guess, that were that were presented during the presentation. And so, you know, one is we're, we're wasting vaccines because of the dosage. And so you, the micro dose, dosage was a solution there. Another one, the ethical part of that is the doctors feeling pressure to administer those dosages before they go bad. And so they, you know, they don't go waste. So that's more of like the upstream part of, of the of the solutioning that I was picking up, but in terms of like the distribution and the line skipping and the nepotism, which are which are things that we need to solve as well, that seems like it's more downstream and in, in the distribution realm that is out of our control. And so, is the focus of the the ethics uh, the the problems that we're trying to solve is more focused on the micro dosage and not wasting the vaccine and and creating education and awareness of the, the vaccine? Or are we trying to focus on the ethics aspect of the nepotism and the lines, you know, the line skipping? Like what part are we focusing on um, for the solution? So that's a great question. And um, I can address that first. Great. So with the upstream uh, and the microdoses, that definitely is our main focus right now because we can do that quickly and in the short term. Mm -hmm. However, with respect to um, your other point, nepotism and landscaping, we discovered that most of it exists because of the misinformation with respect to minority communities being resistant or hesitant, or at least that's a big portion of why this is occurring. And that will go in forth for our longer term solution where we want to establish a trusted relationship with communities and also inform them of um, the solution. And if they're better informed, they'll know how to kind of navigate. And as my colleague Aditya mentioned with his father and having a tough time kind of navigating the system, that also causes a lot of problems with line skipping and nepotism because people who know how to navigate it can easily skip over people who don't. So by informing people and addressing, uh, you know, the hesitancy people have, we see in the longer term, we can address that. But first our focus is the microdoses because we can do that quickly. Okay, great. Thank you. That really clarified a lot. So that was my clarifying question. My supply chain question was, um, did you do, and I'm sorry if I, if I missed this, but did you do an analysis of the financial impact of creating syringes of microdoses and the supply chain 
around stopping all of our production and switching over to a completely different syringe and then refilling and shipping from there. Did, did we do an analysis of that financial cost? So it's not so much actually stopping our production so much as using different bottles in terms of when we are shipping out these original dosage bottles, we're shipping them in trays inside the shippers. And so there's room inside those trays to actually replace, say, one of the slides with a different bottle. And then we already have, we pursued with uh, another company, this new technology in terms of this whole medicine bottle that is actually tamper safe. And we're actually able to then use that. Got it. Okay, great. Thank you. I have another question. What, why are people making multiple appointments? And, and you said your father couldn't navigate the system. Can you explain why there is a problem? Yeah. Uh, when I talk about this problem, I think the best way for me to explain it would be to talk about my personal life and what I've experienced with my friends and my uh, neighbors who are of an elder, elderly age there is a lot of confusion because there's a lot of demand. People want to go places. I mean, people want to just get outside their houses. We've been inside so long, it's understandable. However, it's not understandable and it's not acceptable to be lying about your age or lying about your situation or to be faking yourself as a grandma and getting these vaccines. And so some of these problems are arising because of demand. There's a massive demand for the vaccine because people want to get outside. As a result, people are kind of, uh, you know, putting themselves in multiple different places. They want to go sign up for Stevia, sign up for Walmart. And while you can't blame them for doing that, there has to, there is an issue with the distribution of vaccines that come into that place and the people that don't actually cancel, they don't click the cancel button and say, hey, we don't want to, you know, uh, when I receive text messages from the state of Massachusetts, they ask, hey, did you get your vaccine? You still want uh, notifications of when your date is? I can choose to click stop. As I haven't received my vaccine yet, I have not clicked stop. But when I do, I do plan immediately on saying stop, I have received a date. And as far as confusion goes, there's so many different websites and it's really difficult to know exactly, do I qualify? Do I not qualify? For example, my dad is of the elder age, he's 55 plus, but we weren't sure whether he qualified for both 55 plus as well as uh, any qualifying symptoms or, uh, let me rephrase, we weren't sure whether he could qualify for a certain phase due to both his age and a qualifying symptom or was it one or the other? And so when we tried to call the hotline, they didn't really know either. And we were distributed to one person who thought they knew, and then another person who thought they knew, and then another person who spoke Spanish, and we didn't speak Spanish. So that was a, that was a confusing path that we had took, uh, taken. And so when we see people who are signing up for multiple different sources, people who are on social media, most importantly, Twitter, who are getting confused as to where to go, there's a huge, as I said, uh, vaccine vacuum. It's a lot of information that's being tossed out a lot of times and people are just kind of stuck. They don't know what to do. And some people are getting vaccines illegally. Uh, and some people are, you know, some people that you know are lying about their age just to get vaccines. And so this presents a huge problem that Pfizer can tackle. Just to add on to this, it's a real issue where people will go to their doctors and say, I got the first vaccine, how do I get the second? And the doctors say, I don't know, I can't help you. And people that are homebound, stuck, and they can't even leave the house to go get the vaccine, the qualifications, you have to meet medical qualifications to define as homebound and receive a volunteer that will try and make an appointment to get you a vaccine. It's incredibly difficult to, as you're filtering throughout the process to understand where's the right sources of information I can trust. I looked at my government and it might say conflicting things one week and then social media tells me one thing and suddenly I just don't know which one's safe and which one's right for me. You can understand why different groups are hesitant or resistant and that's why we're trying to address this head on. No, even more so, I think a lot of this problem of people really making multiple appointments is because of fear. Obviously, people are afraid of their for their lives and want to get the vaccine as soon as possible. But even more so, I know from my personal experience, I have friends and family who 
have explained to me that they've gotten the vaccine before my grandmother even, uh, my friend who was 15 years old, got a vaccine before my grandmother and that really shook me to my core. And I asked him how, and he told me how his dad just knew a person and this person said, I can invite my uh, in entire family over of like six people to get vaccinated at the same time. And this was two months ago. And I think this is really the problem where because this information is not really known and creating this problem where people want to get the vaccine in an urgent manner, the, it's really creating this uh, multiple appointments where, and these people who go and get, you know, as Aditya mentioned, who went over to, let's say, person X who has a connection to get the vaccine, they don't then cancel the appointment they already had with MassGov. And that is usually the problem because that creates a no-show on the wastage of the vaccine. Well, uh, overall question for you that we haven't really uh, heard. What about Moderna? What about j and J? I I mean, we're, we're sort of competitors on this, but we're sort of not. We don't really have a lot of control over which is gonna be purchased and sent where. How do they fit into this whole picture with us? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I'm sure you've heard the news about AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson recently. And yes. so I think where we stand as a company is that our mission is equitable healthcare for all. That's the bottom line is that that's what we're trying to do. And so we're not we're not in control of what Johnson Johnson and Moderna are doing in their distribution chains or their dis distribution ladders. But what we're focused on is we're focused on really making sure that everybody can get the vaccine properly and equitably. And so that's what our mission is that what we're focusing on. Part of what makes sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Please. I was going to I was going to say part of what makes Pfizer so unique in this whole crisis is that we've already been established as a leader. And so we're able to take it further and avoid the mistakes that they've maybe encountered with their vaccines and maybe it'll affect our vaccine. But we need to make sure that when we set high standards for ourselves, that way we can lead the industry and others will see and follow. Can, can you describe for me the PrEP Act a little again? Because I'm not sure I understand the legal side of that. I thought that protected companies if there was an adverse effect, like a side effect, like what has happened to AstraZeneca and J&J. And, J and, J. and it, it, people wouldn't take a vaccine without that. People wouldn't even make a vaccine without that. So can you explain to me the legality of that? Because I didn't see that it did apply. So it applies in our current situation in the sense that right now Pfizer is protected uh, by the PrEP Act. If there are any side effects like as to what happened by Johnson Johnson, we are still protected. And so that kind of ties into financial almost in the sense that we're not taking any hits by a lawsuit or any foreseeable lawsuit. However, when we think about the Tynol case, uh, the Chicago Tynol murders in 1982, there was a situation in which Tynol had suffered, you know, uh, cases full of cyanide. And so when I talk about the legality of the situation, it really applies to Pfizer's current situation. But when you think about the Tynol cases, this, while whatever happened, take Johnson Johnson, for example, happened to them, it's really important that they got ahead of it and they mentioned, hey, uh, you know, we're we're going to say, hey, we're gonna pause our distribution of our vaccine. And in the case that that had ever happened to Pfizer, which we don't foresee, that's what something we should have been doing as well. And so when we talk about, you know, inequitable, and inequitable actions that are happening and occurring today, we just wanna state where Pfizer stands currently legally. Shabani, you anything else? You have? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Are, are you fine, Irina? No, no questions from my side. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that. And, and uh, thank you for your answers. We are now going to switch gears and take off our board of directors hats. We are, we are back to being IBEC judges and you are back to being IBEC uh, participants. <laughs> And what we'd like to do is, from the judges, offer you some feedback on how we thought your analysis and your presentation went. And uh, perhaps you might get some ideas to, to improve your 10 minute or your 90 second presentation as they come up tomorrow. Who would, who would like to start? You're, you're, you're the big window on my screen right now, Shabani. So how about you start? <laughs> 
I'm the big lucky winner. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, first off, um, great job with the analysis and great job with communicating uh, with passion and with interest of the subject. As you know, it's a hot topic of today. And so I think you all did a fantastic job in trying to capture the momentum that we're all living in right now. So I just wanted to say kudos for that. Um, I enjoyed the presentation. I felt like I was engaged throughout the way. And so I didn't find myself, you know, my mind straying anywhere. So I thought that uh, said a lot in terms of your presentation skills, the pacing, toning. Um, on that note, I looked down a couple times because I was writing notes. I hope it didn't look like I wasn't paying attention, but that's what I was doing. Um, I. The, the only feedback I would have when you have um, a 10 minute presentation coming up is really to kind of hone in on the upstream or downstream focus of ethics. And the reason I say that is because in my mind, I, I see them as two different things. You know, what happens at the distribution level and the education and awareness that we can provide to support distribution is sort of like a supplemental um, way to support distribution clarity and so the line skipping and the nepotism i feel like that's further away from pfizer's control however your recommendation of like the smaller doses and pro providing education to communities up front i thought was absolutely in pfizer's control and so um my, my only recommendation is in that 10 minutes is to really focus on which part of that um, because there are two really big chunks of information and important parts of ethics but they're different, you know, from each other in my view. So that's the, the only thought I have there. But great job overall. Who's next with Arena? I see I'll, I'll give you some. Okay. So um, I really enjoyed your presentation. I have to congratulate you on the homework that you've done and the way you put together the presentation. And the slides were really good. I mean, it's it's nice to have a uh, where, where the, the verbal presentation and the pictorial one with the slides is, is good. Um, but I'd like to sort of pick up on a couple of things, because while you're highlighting the real issue of equity and fairness in healthcare in the US, because it's different in Europe, but in the US, there's absolutely a problem. But it's still not clear to me what role Pfizer can have in dealing with that because they don't control where the vaccine is finally sent. They, they're shipping, but told to ship X amount here and there. That's, they're just told that, that's all they can do. Um, having been through the gamut of trying to, I'm a little older than you, so I qualified much earlier on um, before they even had this, you know, register yourself. And I can tell you the problem is that the, were 185 different websites. Every one of them, they're run by CVS, Walgreens, Hannaford's, War, uh, Wegmans, by your local community center, um, by CVS in every single store. Um, you know, just, just 185 different sites. Every one of them, you click on it, you have to fill in five pages of forms, of information, all sorts of detail, and then you get to the end and you say, schedule my appointment. And it comes up with, there's no appointments available. Mm -hmm. That was the problem. Mm -hmm. There was, th th they opened up, Massachusetts opened up the website to like, on Monday, they're gonna open it up for 4 million people all on one day, 4 million residents qualify next Monday because they're opening it up broadly to everybody. And there's only going to be like a hundred thousand, you know, shots for for each day. I mean, it, it will crash. That's why the websites crashed. It was the state was mishandling that. Um, and you, and then when you clicked off because there were no appointments and went to somebody else, you have to fill in the form again. There was no standard form. It's all different. They all wanted different information. And I mean, it took me three days to actually get an appointment where I was on day and night. I even set alarms in the middle of the night to get onto a website and it still didn't work. And what happened in the end was random luck. The, the state tells the, 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 the companies that are putting the doses out on a Thursday morning how much they will get. And they put up on Thursday morning, they load the websites with the appointments for the next few days. And I happened to hit on one right on a Thursday morning and I got my appointment. I mean, awful that's the problem and think about what i just described in the technology i have the time 
and the ability to do that. But the people in these communities of minorities don't have the technology, don't have the time. They can't, I mean, I was doing it all day long. You, they don't have the time. That is the problem in Massachusetts. Um, so I, 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 I think that, that how Pfizer could impact that piece of it, I don't know. I can't come up with a good answer because every state is different as well. And by the way, I reached the conclusion that CVS made me go to a national CVS website before they would put me back. What do they do? And Walgreens the same. I then get marketing information from them. And I've had to do delete, take me off your mail list. They're doing it as a marketing tactic. So it, it, that's the mess. Um, so I, I think that if you can think through how Pfizer could be impacting that, it would be really good. The other comment, I wanna come back to the micro doses. <laughs> I hate to say it, but it's actually gone the other way. They started out with six doses per vial and they've taken it up to 10 because that saves money, by the way. Uh, it's only made up at the site as the people come in the door. They don't make it up you know, in, into the syringes ahead that they're making like half an hour to an hour ahead of as people come in the door. So that's not the reason it's it's wasted. It's where they just haven't had enough appointments because what's happened now is it's actually because we're coming to the end of one phase and going in next Monday into another phase, there's actually not enough people left applying for the appointments. So right now you can get an appointment actually ahead of schedule if you went online and did it. So um and I'll tell you one reason why it's not so easy to change the packaging. Under FDA rules, guidance, you have to do stability testing if you change your packaging, if you change the rubber stopper, if you change the crimping, if you change the glass, you have to do stability testing. And that stability testing takes months to do. They were able to go to 10, dos 10 doses per vial because they happen to have already done that and they have the data. So you can't just switch and change things quite the way you described it. So I think it'd be good if you could think through more, why are doses being left at the end of day? It's, it's not huge amounts, but it's, I actually think it's because it's the end of one phase and on Monday that won't be a problem because there'll be so many people looking for appointments. So that, that's a little bit of background as to how this, this works. I was curious about the PREP Act because that applies only to vaccines. And the reason it applies to vaccines in the back in the 1980s, no pharmaceutical company would touch vaccines because there are rare side effects, just like J&J &J and AstraZeneca have right now. They happen. They exist with vaccines. And there's no way you can find out the one in a million, which is what J&J's problem is, one in a million blood clots. You can't find that out in any clinical trial. So without having that protection, nobody would make a vaccine in the world. So it protects from that. The Tylenol issue was totally different. Somebody in a pharmacy tampered with the bottles of Tylenol and put cyanide in them. That is not covered by the PrEP Act. That is something that J&J &J did all the right things. They withdrew it. They put more tamper-proof bottle tops on. They handled it perfectly. But the PREP Act doesn't, you know, the PREP Act is very different. So I'm still not clear on the legal side, that, that, that the legal liability that Pfizer has, other than there's clearly a strong moral obligation for them to try and deal with all these issues. And the moral issues, to me, are critical and, and important. So that's a little bit of background. Sorry, I know too much about this industry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks, Irina. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Really interesting. Uh, you are a very courageous team that you have taken this topic, I think, because, uh, you know, having this hot topic uh, to, to be presented, I think it takes uh, uh, courage. And of course, you may expect a lot of comments, a lot of perspectives. Uh, so I, I like your backgrounds, by the way. So, so thank you for doing that. I, I think it looks very professional uh, as a team, good prep. Um, I think that you have uh, given a very good presentation on the problem statement itself, uh, whilst actually what I I would uh, maybe uh, offer you to do next time uh, a little bit more of is like connect uh, this uh, you know problem statement with the solution more uh, you know cre clearly let's say because I think that Shibani also raised that question on what what exact topic you would want to tackle uh, and what you would want us as a board of directors to tackle yeah uh, I think that um, uh, another thing is that um, 
the perspective around uh, having a lot of resources uh, put into uh, solving the communication issue and the education uh, thing is, is it's a great thought but but actually from the real world uh, the company would have uh, um, not enough resources to do that right because there are some other vaccines other products uh, other patients which are uh, waiting for a company support uh, and, and therefore it's uh, from because I work for consumer healthcare and I know how that works right you 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 have an issue to solve, but you have limited resources to do that. And then you need to balance between uh, what you can do and what you want to do. Yeah. And not always it, it matches uh, really well. That would need to be hired a huge amount of people to support this. Also, practically, uh, it, it could add a lot of um, complication. Not sure that would be uh, possible to be done actually in one company, maybe in collaboration with other companies, uh, you know, producers, manufacturers of the vaccines uh, on the grounds of the, some associations, for example, that could, uh, you know, be even easier maybe to uh, to, to get there. Uh, so, uh, and another thing is that um, um, the, the cost implication for this uh, smaller uh, doses and what uh, Alison has suggested, uh, the, the specific um, regulation perspective, yes, yeah, so or how to make it happen any change to the artwork, any change to the packaging, any change to the bottle would need to be uh, aligned and it's a lot of a waiting time and I'm sure that the regulators would prioritize this based on the uh, problem itself but still you know it requires it's, it's a long way to do that uh, and cost implication for us as Pfizer uh, as you addressed it to the board of directors would maybe need to have a little bit more assumptions around that context right um, and uh, maybe also to give you some further food for thought uh, when uh, some things like uh, what's happening in the industry are starting to uh, get sold by commercial organizations, uh, it involves a lot of the conversation at the level of the government affairs department. So the government affairs department would need to talk to the government to really understand how to uh, how to take it as a single voice. You know what I mean? It's like uh, that uh, government would also have some communication campaigns. I don't know how this works in states uh, in particular, but in Europe, governments have these communication campaigns as well. And that uh, in, it requires this alignment and collaboration, uh, and therefore involves a lot of this um, um, like ethics and compliance context, government affairs uh, engagement. So a little bit of that um, as well. But overall, I think you have uh, uh, definitely clearly defined the problem statement. It was also very interesting for me to listen to what you were sharing because the European perspective uh, um, is, is somewhere on my radar. Uh, states not that much but I see that the issues are pretty much the same, I would say. And the problem statement uh, was really very well defined, as well as the solution as, uh, you know, production of the microdoses is definitely one of the very good ideas. Uh, and thank you very much for the presentation. It was really a pleasure to listen to you. And Q&A was wonderful as well, by the way. Thank you. Excellent. Lots of good feedback. Do you have any questions for us, uh, student team? Do you have any, any questions that we could that we could help you with? Where your ten minute or ninety second? Do you feel like you got some good feedback here you can work with? You feel you feel you got you got what you need from us? Okay. Well, that that sounds really good. And and um, really, again, we appreciate your your participation in IBEC. We know that this is a lot of work. And it's a lot to take in. All the teams get lots of feedback from, from uh, the judges because IBEC is as much a learning event for everybody. We learn from you and you're learning some perspectives from us. So it is a, it is a two-way street and thank you for, for everything you bring to it. And 